Um, thank you. Uh, I'm, um, some people say obsession is such an irritating word. It's, uh, it's fun. Um, I taught in Farmington for 38 years at, in middle school, and a few former colleagues are here. Uh, 38 years of middle school does something to you. I'm not asking for sympathy, it was just a fact. Uh, and I taught at Hamlin University for 25 years of that also. Uh, but I've been playing guitar for oh, 50 some years and uh, have a, quite a bit to show you. To start, if you were a little kid 500 years ago, the guitar didn't exist. This is what the guitar was. That's called a lute. L-O-O-T is money, lute is L-U-T-E. <laughs> and it looks like something you grow in your garden and add strings. But these are actually individual strips of cherry wood. And uh, when I was teaching, I'd tell the kids, if you take a two by four, put it through a bandsaw 13 times, you have the same grain. And one thing that was kind of a superstitious tradition is you'd, they'd take a piece that had a knot so you could see where it started, developed, and then disappeared which is kind of cool. Uh, if you're a guitar person, inlaid frets weren't around for another few hundred years. These are uh, gut, cheap intestine, um, gut strings, and the top, that's called the rose out in the center, and that's carved out of the top itself, and that is just the, uh, the, uh, the builder showing off how well he can carve. So I'm good, incredibly ornate. If anything, it impeded the sound. But when you go like any stringed instrument, <coughs> The sound waves start here, it starts the top vibrating, and everything shoots down in and bounces. In this case, it bounces in millions of directions because it's a round back. And you end up with about 35% of the sound that actually comes out. They discovered when they broke, they sounded better. So they started making them with a flat back, and all of a sudden you had 75-80%. Sound would go back and shoot straight forward. But this is what the lute was. Um, <clears throat> it was a kind of thing like today, like guitar, everybody played it, and a few people played it very well. Uh, you had everything from to and on and so forth. Now, one thing, um, because it's round, you definitely don't wear, want to wear anything that has polyester at all. <laughs> or it slips. So this holds it. Now, uh, the lute was, that was the instrument of the time. And if you were a, uh, a lutenist, the highest you could go uh, would be uh, to be a minstrel in a court uh, for a king. And uh, oftentimes you were lent out to other, other places. John Dowland was the most famous of the lutenists and lute composers. Uh, he was with Queen Elizabeth and later lent out for a year to the King of Denmark. So that was the equivalent of ACDC on a world tour, to be able to do that. So I'll give you an idea of the sound. Very soft, you'd expect it to be louder. Thank you. <laughs> Give you a little idea of the sound. Now, 
this is a tenor size, uh, tenor lute, which is standard. If you were in a court, they had what was called a band of music, band, B-A-N-D-E, music, M-U-S-I-C-K-E, -C M -U -S -I -C -K -E. changing spelled somewhere along the way, just shortened to band, uh, but there would possibly be a lute and uh, viola de gamba, which was like a small cello, uh, sackbut, which is an ancestor of the trombone, uh, let's see, recorders, soprano, alto, tenor, bass recorders, and you might have what is called a descant lute or soprano lute, Cute little guy. Uh, this is a, this, the lute that I have there was built by Daniel Larson, who is Duluth, Minnesota, one of the finest builders in the world, located. Uh, this was made by, I'll talk about this, this gentleman in a minute, but this is bird's eye maple and paduk, which is a, a redwood from Northern Africa. And in between each one is a thin spacer of ebony. So just a craftsmanship on this. It would be anywhere from a third to an octave higher. And it would do the cutesy stuff, sort of like a soprano um, in a choir singing a descant. And they're notorious for being out of tune in January. Uh, I got here two hours ago and I've been tuning ever since. So anybody have perfect pitch, I apologize. Uh, this is a piece by John Dowland. Most everything in loop music was a theme in variations, where they'd start off with a main melody and then improvise the variations on it. This is called the Frog Galliard, three, four time it jumped, so it's where the name came from. There are 30 original manuscripts that all have the same uh, theme, but then wild different variations. Just depended how we played it a certain night at a concert, wrote it out for somebody. So uh, this, is, this is one of the many original by him. Ooh. Sorry, it's way out. <laughs> the tune is just too far gone on it. <laughs> Thank you. And the thing is, it has these traditional tuning pegs. They're very pretty, but terribly difficult when they're this close together. And, but that gives you an idea of the sound. And a lute is a, a very soft, intimate instrument. Uh, it's still done. A lot of pieces written for lute and voice. In seven, let's see, 1530. Uh, in Spain, a new instrument started to evolve, came out, it was called uh, a vihuela, or la primera guitarra española, the first Spanish guitar. And this is what the first guitars looked like. And uh, this is made with Romanian walnut and Romanian cherry wood um, and Romanian maple. You can guess where it was made. Uh, a fine, fine builder and his name, uh, Georgi Lorinsky. And I had um, contacted him and it took about a year or two. I'd ordered this and the, the loot, the small loot from him. Uh, and I got the invoice and was gonna do an international bank uh, wire. And I brought it to TCF, where, of course, you have children with barely changed voices that wait on you. And it said, um, Bank of Transylvania. <laughs> well, the kid looked at it and said, this is not real. And I said, Transylvania is one of the most beautiful places on earth. I have to get my manager. I said, that's fine. He came in. 
Manager came out grinning and the kid could have died. He was just cherry red. No, you thought I was trying to run a scam. That's you did exactly what you should do. But the invoice is just great to see that. And uh, has a, this is parchment and wood as far as the rows in the middle. But musicians loved it. It was much easier. See, the lute with that jutting back neck was called a broken neck 500 years ago because that is a 19 string creature. And if it was straight, it would have warped. So they had it angle backwards, and then all of the tension would be on uh, the piece of ivory that's at the top there. Now this, musicians loved. Much easier. We'll play it and live through it here. Uh, much easier to carry, uh, to carry on, much louder than the lute was, and the purists thought it'll never replace the lute. And it took about 30 years, and lute was pretty much done. This will give you an idea of the sound. used for accompanying voice. Uh, so you had the same kind of thing where it would be equivalent to somebody playing and singing folk songs today. And it just, this started the whole evolution. It was in Spain, nobody else, uh, other countries didn't have it. The King of Spain wanted to make it known as a national instrument. And he hired a guy named uh, Luis Milan, who wrote the selection I just played, to do nothing but compose for the, the new instrument. And this started from here, it just evolved into uh, what became the guitar. Then in <coughs> the 1800s, or so, I'm sorry, 1700s, they were late 16 into 1700s, they were still using the lute, but it changed a little. It grew. And I think that click just now was a string snapping. Um, Minnesota in winter is not a good place for a human being or a good piece of wood. And uh, so anyway, this is a called a Baroque lute, an arch lute. Time of Bach. This is a re reproduction. There are several lutes that have survived. Uh, they're in museums, and basically they can't even be brought up to pitch because we're looking at 500-year-old kindling pretty much extremely dry. But mine is copied after one from 1530. Uh, they are cat have been CAT scanned and x-rayed, so they're virtually identical to how they were built. Now, not bad. OK, we'll try. On this, like all the lutes, the fingerboards are so wide you can't see what you're doing. If you're a guitarist, you just go by feel. Uh, this one, well, one thing about the lute that people don't realize, the Messiah, George Frederick Handel, in the original orchestration, uh, called for two arch lutes. And somewhere along the way, we got kicked out, probably for talking. Uh, this will give you an idea. Idea of the sound. This is a piece by a French composer, um, uh, Robert de Visay. And it was from a suite written for the lute. But again, it's a very quiet instrument. And this wood is very beautiful. Uh, it's from Northern Africa, it's called blackwood, even though it, it, the wood in a tree can go from jet black to uh, bright and everything in between. So it's a beautiful wood and a very nice tone wood.
fingering on six what are called courses. A guitar, regular guitar has six courses of one string each. A 12 string guitar has six courses of two strings each, where you play the two strings as if they're one. On a lute, the first course is single because that's where you do a lot of your melody work. And then double. And here they drop into octaves. And you can set the additional basses any way you want. So at the end of that, um, just drop something an octave. Uh, it didn't last long, in less than a century. It was, it was out. Just, it's so unwieldy. But there is one monster even larger called a thoroughbow, which was a bass instrument. It was basically in the same range of a string bass, but seven feet long because of the long strings. So now the instruments will be far better in tune. <laughs> There, this is a guitar uh, that was in the evolution process. This was built in 1785 in England. It's made out of English U, Y-E-W, which was what the longbows um, of, um, uh, of England, Robin Hood days, were made out of because you could steam it, bend it, and it retained the shape. The longbows were the most lethal weapon on earth because they could outshoot um, the French by 50, 60 yards. You could, they're seven feet long, pulling the bow until the two tips are about 18 inches apart. Well, it also made wonderful instruments. It's a beautiful tone wood. And the neck is a single piece uh, of Brazilian rosewood. Around the top, it's carved and then black ink and then shellacked over. I don't know the, uh, the builder, but down here, a little floral design has the initials AP. So, it is be possibly playable here. It, the one thing about, oop, good enough. The wood on it, uh, it's interesting, the 1700s, they were using Brazilian, Brazilian rosewood, wood from all over the, the New World. Uh, the new, it was, uh, besides being visually beautiful, it was the best sounding. I have extremely thin strings on this uh, because there's a huge crack that needs repairing. Might be 150, might be 200 years old, we don't know. But just a, a little idea of um, very soft. So that's uh, really one of the first in the evolution. First two courses are single and then double strung. And as they got larger and they learned a little bit more about sound production, uh, they went eventually to just six strings instead of all the additional, the double strings trying to get more sound. This is a guitar from uh, 1835, and much better. Uh, I have it tuned a little lower, a half step low, because uh, it's 185 years old, and the tension, uh, even just one half step, takes off a tremendous amount of pressure. Has what was called a mustache bridge. This is Brazilian rosewood, elephant tusk ivory, Mother of Pearl set into ebony uh, when I was teaching, and the neck is a solid piece of ebony. Teaching, I told the kids they did not get on the internet and order the raw materials and have them FedExed overnight. It took many months just to get, so if you were a builder, you bought as, uh, as much as you could afford materials for maybe six, seven guitars, and by the time you're getting close to the end, you put in another order. Uh, if a ship sank, you lost a few months of work. So this is strung with gut strings that have a beautiful, sweet tone but that's the only tone you can get is a real rich you can play a piece from um, oh I'll have to read the label to you imported and sold by S. Chappelle music seller to His Majesty the King 50 New Bond Street London and I bought this when I was first out of college at a guitar store in in Minneapolis called The Podium, a wonderful place that anybody ever played knew about The Podium. 
And it came from the owner's mother-in-law going back four generations. Uh, husband started the International Monetary System with another group of bankers in uh, London, and the wife was a patron of the London Guitar Society. She, so I know the history of this. She would find three aspiring artists, uh, set them up with an apartment, an allowance, and a uh, state-of-the-art instrument for one year and to get them going. And this is one of those instruments. So it's kind of cool. Um, it was built in uh, Mirecourt, France, which is about 40 kilometers outside of Paris. Uh, the entire town was guitar builders. So if you were a little kid there, your parents were guitar builders and you learned how to do it. And one of the first things you would learn is probably how to carve a neck. And by the time you were 12 years old, you could carve a neck better than anybody else in the world. And sisters would learn how to maybe steam the wood. Mom would learn something else. Dad would put the whole thing together. So basically, they had assembly line long before Henry Ford. Uh, and now it sounds, looks and sounds like a guitar. Fernando Sor was a guitar, um, one of the first serious guitar players in Spain in the 1830s. And this is a, just an exercise by him. In those days, I know we've got a lot of guitarists here that will recognize the name Mel, Mel Bay. <laughs> Get him one. Some <laughs> a uke by the time he's four. Uh, Mel Bay, and it, a method book that we all learned how to play out of. And it, um, they didn't have that. If you were a teacher, you wrote a piece for your student every week. So consequently, there are thousands of, of etudes uh, by Fernando Sor and some of our ph phenomenal concert pieces. This is just one, a product of one of those. sweet sound. <laughs> also, if you're a guitarist, in between each fret, the very thin frets, is curved, which made it almost no stress at all on your hand. It's very easy to play. As the music for guitar progressed, getting into more wilder Spanish, uh, heavier playing, uh, the design changed. And it uh, just, this is one of the steps in the evolution. Like this till about the 1840s, and then started to change even more. Um, by 1880, 1882, a, guitar, or a cabinet maker in Madrid, Jose Ramirez, thought there was such a demand for this instrument, for the new instrument, and he thought, I can do that, I can build those, and started, and Jose, House of Ramirez is on Jose Ramirez the sixth right now. Still the finest uh, classical guitar is built. Most of the builders in Madrid or in Spain period went through apprentice, apprenticeship, journeyman, and master builder program through the Ramirez workshop. And uh, it's a seven year course. So if you wash out at any time in the, some, some of the things you can't do, that's the end of it. Like I said before, the first thing you do is learn how to carve the neck, then steam the wood. This is a little flamenco guitar. Beautiful little thing. It was not for a child. This was a state-of-the-art, very expensive instrument. Uh, this is strung with gut strings again. G uh, flamenco is a style of music, extremely ri pure rhythm. Uh, it is originally accompaniment for, for singing and dancing. Now, every piece is a rhythm. There's a certain one. The one I'm going to play for you is called a faruca, and it's like a waltz and as far as uh, the title of the, of the uh, uh, dance itself. This is a tap plate. Out of, this is a piece of tortoise wood because in this type of music, you hit the top of the guitar. 
Well, one tap here and you have a gouge, and one song you have a hole about the size of a dime. So it's uh, not very cost effective. This has made it since this was built in 1900. Highly flamed maple that violin build builders would kill for. Just gorgeous. And in the sun, uh, it moves. That's yeah, too far away from us now. <laughs> anyway, and you can see if you're a guitar person where they'd use capos, where there's a little hole where they had dug in to the back. Anyway, this is a piece, give you an idea, uh, called a furuka. Now, if I was a, a flamenco uh, accompanying a dancer, I would be following signals with a hand and uh, hands and feet to go into a different section. Two sections. One is like a chorus, always comes back to it, and then the rest is improvisation. So when you're in that section, uh, the dancer might decide she'd like, he or she'd like to do it for the next three minutes in there, and you're making it up as you go along, then you get the signal and go back. So you'll hear it always coming back to this first part. So it's not a lullaby that you would put a child to sleep. And it's uh, also not the kind of thing that you go home humming. And uh, this could go for three minutes or it could go for 10, 12 minutes, depending on what the dancer uh, wants to do. Then uh, I'm going to jump over a little to America. A guy named um, Christian Frederick Martin, founder of Martin Guitars in uh, in uh, New York City in, let's see, in 1834 when he started building in America, then moved to uh, Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a beautiful little thing, C.F. Mar uh, Martin, 1850. So it's been around quite a while. And Brazilian rosewood, ebony neck, uh, German spruce top. It's little. And this is, you know, the ancestors of Martin Guitar, which are some of the most revered there are now. And I'm going to play a piece, an old Chet Atkins piece, that he wrote as kind of what he called a reconciliation piece um, for the North and South. It's called Yankee Doodle Dixie. He plays both simultaneously at the same time. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. We'll see here. <laughs>
So, thank you. <laughs> now, up here, these were not built really to play up here. Uh, they're almost like playing rubber bands, but down here, the action is wonderful, and just the historical significance of it. It's a wonderful little, little guitar. Then, one about the same time, the banjo. Much maligned instrument through history. Uh, banjo really is a wonderful instrument. And uh, there are many jokes about banjos, um, some that I can even tell. Uh, it is definition of a gentleman as someone that knows how to play a banjo and doesn't. Uh, let's see, if, do you know how it's tuned? It's never been done. Uh, and the best, perfect pitch. You throw a banjo into a dumpster and it lands on an accordion. Um, anyway, this is a... A uh, little Civil War era, 1860s, extremely light, maybe not even two pounds. Uh, walnut neck and no frets. These are called incised frets where they cut the slot and it's, this is three narrow pieces, white, green, white, but like putting a toothpick in and then sanding it flush. So they're markers. So you get this wonderful, true folky sound. Only eight lugs. Modern ones are 32. The tighter it is, the louder. This is an original head, uh, which was probably pigskin and bleached white originally, but through a century and a half oxidation, it's just turned. And they would have had gut strings. Um, those days, the entire market was a confederacy. Okay, but just like industry, all of the builders were in the north. So if you wanted a fine banjo and you lived in the south, you had to buy it from a Yankee. And what they did, which was really quite nasty, as you can see at each lug, there's a brass eagle. Or they put an American flag or the Union shield. So the first thing you did is rip those ugly things off. They're only held by a, a, a little bolt underneath. A lot of these have, that have survived, you can see the shadow from what was there. But this, I don't know any of the history of it, I'd love to. But the sound, you know, can hear... Anywhere from just sitting on the porch singing to uh, what was called frailing, like uh, instrument. Thank you. Now the evolution of the guitar took many centuries and it's still going on. Guitars now, with the, they look the same, but compared to 25, 30 years ago, the construction underneath keeps changing and they get more and more powerful. Um, banjo went through an evolution in a matter of, of 25, 30 years. This was from the 1860s. This is from the 1890s and I have, it's a plastic head, I want to get a skin head on it, but you can see incredibly beautiful inlay. Now it's done by laser. It wasn't done by laser cutting, cutting then. This is uh, from 1898 and then chip carved on the back. Now if you order, and 32 lugs, so I don't want to scare anybody. This is, this is quite loud. And that's with nylon strings. Uh, they're a cherry neck and they didn't start using steel strings on them until the, uh, the onset of, of bluegrass music. About 1917, World War I, they started using, uh, making them. Gibson made, company made them with steel strings, but they used maple necks, hard rock maple like granite. All right, well, people have these beautiful old things with uh, cherry, which is a hardwood, but it's a very soft hardwood. And they put metal strings on to modernize it, and they warped the necks. But this survived, uh, this is a product of banjo orchestras. In the 18, from about 1890 to 1920, every university in the United States had a banjo orchestra. And I have a picture of the University of Minnesota Banjo Club from 1905. 60 young men, tuxedos, hair parted in the middle, sitting proudly with their banjo. And they were uh, just like choral music, SATB, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and piccolo. And you have to have all of them. Uh, I brought some of them, but the sound, 
that piece I just played compared to the gut struck. You know, the Much louder. That was uh, 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 there was also another type of genre of um, music where they took classical guitar technique and put it on the banjo, which there are a lot of jokes about too. But it uh, worked. This was the um, tenor sized, and this was a soprano. Cute little thing. And this, uh, I know the history of this. In New York City, this was made by a company called Buckby. Uh, New York City, a man wanted this for his wife, ordered it, and he had, you could get different degrees of ornamentation, whatever you want. And if you wanted Minnehaha Falls put in it, someone would do it. They would send the fingerboard to the finest and lay artists in the city. They'd do that, put it back on. Uh, this one, I don't think I showed, has chip carving on the back. You could have that done, and then they'd put it all together when they had all the pieces with the artwork done. He also wanted her name put in Mother of Pearl on the heel stock in the back, and her name was Pearl. <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> it's just like eighth graders. Um, <laughs> this is the fourth higher than the other, and it is uh, giving an idea of the solo music. A lot of fiddle tunes that were done and played uh, on, the on, on the banjo. I have, uh, this is a soprano, I have the alto size at home, and I didn't bring that, and I have the bass, which is like this, the pot on it, but they're very interesting because it had interchangeable necks. You could have a banjo neck, a guitar neck, or a bass neck on it, and uh, depending on what, um, the, also the size of it was used a lot in early vaudeville before PA systems because they were so large, they were so loud. So many of the guitarists had a banjo body but with a guitar neck. Louis Armstrong's um, uh, banjo player, Johnny St. Cyr, didn't know how to play banjo. He had a regular sized banjo but with a guitar neck on it. And a lot of them didn't. I thought, no. And then I listened to one of the old recordings of the Hot Five and Hot Seven, it's definitely guitar, but sounds like a banjo. This is a piccolo. And I usually then show the piece I just played uh, an octave higher. However, this suffered the dryness of Minnesota. I just opened up the case when I got here, ping, which is a wonderful sound for a split second. Uh, <laughs> it's made by, these are made by the same company, these three, S.S. Stewart and a little ivory piece, S.S. Stewart, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And around here, another little piece of ivory that says Little Wonder. And that was the model, the little wonder. Has an ivory rose at the bottom that's carved. And first you look at it and it looks like a toy, but you have, um, however, no fifths. So just for show and tell. Uh, mandolin is an instrument that uh, evolved in, in, from Italy. And actually, I should show the old one first. Um, they're tuned like a violin. The word mando means hand. So mandolin, and violin, vial, is a bow. So, but the tunings are the same. So if you're a fiddle player, you can pick up a mandolin and play it. This is a beautiful little thing. Made by Wurlitzer Company, who also made, I remember I grew up with a Wurlitzer piano in our house. And these are 32 Brazilian rosewood ribs with uh, pearwood spacers in it. The top has all this mother of pearl, and it's interesting, Saturn is here. This was made in the 1890s, and that was when they first were getting home telescopes that, for the public, you could buy one. So there's a lot of instruments that have the moon, different phases of the moon carved in one. Um, 
one banjo company that made, oh, what is it called? Uh, Man on the Moon design up on the, on the top in Mother of Pearl. And then you've got all this ivory, turtle shell. So this is a triple um, environmental whammy no-no right now. Brazilian rosewood, which uh, is commercially extinct. Uh, tortoise shell, which was since I think in the 1930s, it was the first international ban because they were slaughtering tortoises worldwide for hair combs just to make you beautiful, and uh, ivory. So, but it's a cool little thing. I really didn't throw it at you. Uh, fun to play. It's hard to hold, but they were using classical music. Beethoven wrote several things for mandolin, which is kind of cool, but to get an idea, get my chamois back here. Here we go. A lot of fiddle tunes on them. And Thank you. This, um, I have another one. Oh, I have a few more. One of them that I didn't bring that is just beautiful inlaid, uh, uh, a beautiful, in and I never brought it to school for certain reasons, a beautiful inlaid mermaid dressed as a mermaid would have been. Uh, and the, uh, but the artistic, the, the carving, the inlay work is just phenomenal on these old instruments. Then, this is also from the same year, 1898. It's called a mandolinetto, which is a guitar-shaped mandolin. This is one of the most beautiful pieces in Brazilian. It looks like melted Crayola crayons. Uh, and tortoiseshell, ivory. Um, this is one of the first carved arched tops. This came before the arch top guitars. And it is curved, and you get a different sound. The sound was actually roll. Then E.H., Elias Howe, not the Elias Howe that invented the sewing machine, but another one, uh, inlaid in ivory into the um, uh, tortoise shell. But this is a very lively. That same piece. So loud little thing, ivory binding, and um, then etched uh, mother of pearl on the inlays. And 1901, Orville Gibson came out with what evolved into a bluegrass banjo. This is a little Gibson. Uh, the top of the line always had the Gibson in Mother Pearl and in here on the bottom. And it is um, birch bark, or birch bark, birch, back and sides, and a very thick cedar top with a little pick guard that's inlaid. And the neat thing, if you're a guitar person, the label has Gibson Mandolin and Guitar Manufacturing Company Limited, Company Limited Kalamazoo, Michigan, USA. They're in Kalamazoo for many decades. And it's got Orville's picture on it. So it's an, an Orville label, but very loud. So they're fun to play, a uh, lively little thing, but the, how they evolved in the different, different shapes is just kind of interesting. Then, one of my favorite, ukulele. If you say ukulele in Hawaii, you're a stupid tourist. If you say ukulele here, uh, ukulele and ukulele here, you're a snob, so take your pick. But it is the actual pronunciation of ukulele, and those of you old enough to remember Arthur Godfrey on his radio broadcast, all he's talked about the ukulele and really pushed for it, became real popular at World Exposition, I don't remember where it was. I don't know if it was in Seattle, but it was, in, uh, it was on the coast in uh, the 1920s, and there was a pavilion from Hawaii, and they had this instrument. And this is from 1920s. Um, it is called an echo, echo uke, genuine koa wood. Koa only grows in, in Hawaii. Uh, beautiful tone wood and a beautiful wood. The crest of Hawaii and a decal on the top, very tiny. <laughs> Cl 
closer together than a mandolin. Well, people in the 1920s were much smaller. And they were the South Sea Islands, and they were smaller yet. So this hit America, and everybody, you were nobody if you went to college and you didn't play a uke. And, I mean, girls just swooned. It was great for love songs. Um, too small to really plan. Well, in the late 20s, Hollywood got a hold of it. They started using them in, in movies, and... The next size, which would be an alto, but it's called a concert size. A little bit larger and a little louder. This is made out of acacia wood from China. And again, uh, this is uh, made in Vietnam. Uh, the builder is a fantastic inlay artist. And you could order it and have anything you want. He'd do it. He would put it in. I just put, had him do fancy flowers. But this kind of thing. Um, That kind of thing. Thank you. Then, later still, into the 30s, guitarists wanted a little larger. This is a tenor. And, yes. Pardon me? Good idea. This is flamed koa, which is absolutely beautiful. And in the sunlight, it moves. The grain looks like you could reach inside of it. So this uh, builder in, uh, in Hawaii makes about 10 of this model a year. It's called a kuuipo, which means sweetheart in Hawaiian. So he had this, that shaped sound hole, various other things. Instead of mother of pearl, this is sound from Kalua Beach on Maui. <laughs> they have inlay. It's a little hokey, but it's, it's neat. And it, uh, all three sizes are tuned the same. The only difference is the size itself. And this, uh, this one, I uh, ordered a few years ago and got it. It's just a wonderful instrument. People don't realize, though, that it's a real instrument. You have uh, Hollywood got a hold of it, and later jazz people in the 1950s. You have like... Um That kind of thing. Um, George Harrison loved, absolutely loved the uke. And he showed up at Tom Petty's house with Forum, and Petty said, what? He said, just let me in. You'll like it. And he always kept some in the trunk to bring to friends. Uh, and he was a phenomenal player, but he never showed off. A very, if you listen to all the record, Beatles sings, does a little bit of lead, but not much. And he was the shy one of it. Um, he wrote, Here Comes the Sun, and wanted it done, the intro on the uke. And the other three said, no, we're not going to. So what he did, put a capo, which is a bar, on the fifth fret of the guitar, played it up here, and it sounded like a ukulele. So he kind of won. Uh, this is a, give you an idea of a few things that it's capable of.
Thank you. So, um, oh, one other quick thing on here, just to show that since it's still not far from Christmas, uh, came out in a TV special in 1962 and has been a real popular Christmas piece ever since. Christmas time is here, but it shows that you can do a, some thick lush sound on four strings here. Thank you. Now, uh, resonator uke, just like the resonator guitars that were developed in the 1920s before PA systems, uh, they looked like a hubcap and they had chambers inside metal that would project and really amplify, acoustically amplify the music. Uh, quite brash, but, but uh, loud. Um, You can do all sorts of cool stuff with them. And this last one, I forgot I had with me. Uh, this is a harp uke, a lot like what the harp guitars were in the 1920s. Just extra bass strings. So you can play something. Pretty good. Uh, this is made out of a Mexican rosewood called Zercote. Very, very pretty. And the top is sinker redwood that was pulled from the bottom of an old mill pond in, um, in California. Uh, probably 150 years old or so. Uh, the, this was built by a, an American builder that mo moved to um, uh, Lviv, the Ukraine. And I bought it a few years ago. But you could do things like, oh, like what I just played with Here Comes the Sun. Oops. Too out of tune. Sorry. Um, but you have not quite a scale, but you can see when you have a tune, you can do, do things, uh, many more things just with uh, dropping things a bass and adding to it. So that's a, just a fun instrument. I know we have someone here, a friend who has a, an old harp guitar. And it's the same, same kind of thing. Now, back to guitar. This was made by uh, Jose Ramirez II. Talked about Ramirez I. You notice this one had, the first one had this beautiful flamed maple. This is a rather plain wood. It's called Cypress. And in 1929, crash of the stock market, Spain also lost a lot because they were invested very heavily in the US stock market. So, 
guitar builders could no longer afford that wonderful, expensive wood, they went to this cheap garbage wood that was used for fuel called cypress. And they loved it. It's been standard ever since. It has a very quick decay. It, you know, this was also a fur neck, which is very stable. It just isn't pretty like the mahogany or others. Very simple. Um, and has what you call a quick decay. You're moving sometimes so fast that if all the notes keep resounding, it sounds just muffled. So uh, the Cypress, and it's been standard ever since. This is a piece called a Cigarillas. It's a very stately dance. You don't have any of the cutesy, fast, flying flamenco stuff, uh, but it's alternating rhythm of six, eight, three, four time. So you have like... flamenco pieces this could go on for 10 minutes but that's the basic structure of that uh, that dance now this is a modern uh, modern classical guitar and it is Brazilian rosewood uh, spruce top and actually there are two tops underneath this is this is a Swiss spruce and underneath the Spanish cedar but in between only about uh, an eighth of an inch in between if you look down into it if they have the top could come off, it looks like you're looking into a, a beehive honeycomb. And what that does is it's all, uh, some are, this one was carved out, but many of them are laser done now, and it just is that much more resonance power. The neck is bobinga, which is a cool, looks kind of like a rust color and bird's eye maple on steroids. And it is uh, very, it's built by a, my only Canadian instrument, Sergei de Jong. <laughs> Uh, this is, um, I had several modifications I wanted, a shorter scale, this, 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 different wood. And I'd been on this uh, builder's list for, on his waiting list for three years. And I had a Neely replacement. In fact, I wonder how many collective pounds of titanium we have in this room. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand, no. Uh, anyway, I had a knee replacement. And the day after, I was still in the hospital, still on the good stuff. And I got my phone rang and I said, Quebec. And I said, hello. And he said, hello, Randall. This is Kirby, this is Sergei de Jong in Quebec. How are you? And I went, I am just fine, Sergei. How are you? you know. So anyway, we talked about what I wanted and, specific, and woods and everything. And he sent me, Brazilian rosewood is controlled. Uh, I can't leave the country with this because of present regulations. If I came back and I didn't have the proper paperwork, uh, it would be confiscated and burned. So it's, uh, that's going to change eventually, but uh, it, it is what's called commercially extinct, but still the finest tone wood. He sent me uh, pictures of his five, five sets of Brazilian, said, pick what you want, and da da da. So after I'd, uh, we'd talked for a while, and he said, okay, well, I've got that, I'll be starting on your instrument. And this was in July, and he said, you get it just shortly before Christmas. A lot of the time in building is drying time where the wood has the gluing up and drying. And he said, and I believe we'll talk again in a couple weeks just to make sure. So anyway, uh, that's my morphine induced purchase. Uh, this is a piece called uh, Asturias Leyenda. Asturias is a city in Spain and Leyenda means legend. So it's the legend of Asturias. And it was written by Itzhak Albanus in uh, about 1900. And it's originally for piano, but to imitate a guitar. And it's from Suite Espanol, which is nine, uh, seven pieces, each about a different city in Spain. This is uh, about the city of Asturias.
<laughs> Thank you. Um, and play a real contrasting one on here. Uh, this is a piece by those of you that remember Simon and Garfunkel. They are, their, their first album had a guitar solo on it that everybody wanted to learn. In ninth grade, I would, would have killed for that piece. It's called Angie. And Davy Graham was started the fingerstyle uh, type of playing in, in England, had written it. And um, he wrote it for a young woman by the name of Angie and made him famous, and she dumped him. But <laughs> this is uh, just a rhythm and blues piece. Another one, uh, only steel string guitar that I brought today, but this is just cool. A Gibson again, it says the Gibson at the top. And this was uh, 1917, last year that they made the pick guards out of actual tortoise. And that this, and if you're, this is just an incredible contraption that they did before they started gluing the pick guards on. Uh, but this will, just a neat. And you could tell this binding was white originally. It's called celluloid, it was an early plastic. And it's much lighter on here than here. The owner of this smoked heavily. And it's not gross or slimy, it just, it's permanently stained and that's on a lot of the old, uh, old guitars, possibly played in a bar, which added to it, but cool old instrument. And, uh, this is just a piece by the Carter family, an old from around the same era, uh, Wildwood Flower. And I have uh, just a couple pieces left. One that, um, let's see, 
Here we go. I usually don't sand finger, sandpaper my fingernails in public, but uh, when you play uh, with the fingernails, you get, gentlemen, you won't know what I'm talking about, but you know when you file your nails, the garbage you get underneath the nail, that clicks and drives it. So what you do is, and it also, playing is like playing on sandpaper, whereas it's not, this gets rid of the click. And no, I'm no longer embarrassed by doing this either. Okay. Um, <laughs> This I have to play for a friend who requested it. It's uh, one of the most beautiful Lennon and McCartney pieces. The last piece, last guitar and last piece here that I'm going to play is, um, here we go. This is, I talked about the Ramirez builders uh, in Madrid. I have these two, the Ramirez one, Ramirez two, and I've got uh, three more Ramirez at home. The, um, this is the arch rival. They were other side of Madrid, and another style of construction, just a little bit different. And the uh, Conde Hermanos, the Conde brothers. This was made in 1959. Uh, it is an extremely monster scale. Uh, the standard scale is, is 650 millimeter. This is 685. And the reason is the longer the scale, the more power you get. Well, in flamenco, they wanted that power, but they didn't have it because they didn't use rosewood. It was cypress. So what they did, they made them much longer, and then you put what's called a capo on the third fret. So you still had the power of the instrument, but it was much easier to play. This is a cool piece. Um, I had, uh, uh, 10 years ago, my son was studying in Madrid and called and said, Dad, you should come over. We'd, you'd have a ball, any kid that wants their father to come to Madrid. So I went over and... He was in school all day and I went to builders that I'd gone to 35 years earlier. Nothing had changed, it was really cool. Um, I got a, and I got a guitar, and of course, and uh, on the way back, he was gonna meet me at a flamenco club on the other side of Madrid, so I didn't go back to, I brought it with me, and um, we're coming in and the, the owner met us at the door and said, oh, you have a guitar, and, I said, and my son said, yeah, my father's really a pretty good flamenco guitarist for an American, <laughs> and he said, well, he'll have to play for us, and I smiled, we went in, I told my son, you have no idea what you just did, <laughs> so we got through about an hour, and I thought, I'm safe, and then they said, we have a friend from America who uh, has a guitar with him, and so in, even 10 years ago, English was, was scarce, still a hangover from the Franco regime. Anybody under 30 had studied, but anybody over 30, you didn't know a word of Spanish. And uh, so I went up and I sat with the two house guitarists and they said, que quieres decir, what do you wish to play? And I said, soliadas and me, they do the do, re, mi. So soliadas, give e. Bueno, so we started and I knew what was gonna happen. After about um, one minute, the first guitarist dropped out and after about another 45 seconds, the other guitarist dropped out. They wanted to see what I could do. Well, I told you that the dancer controls by going into the improvisation section or back to the room section. 
oh, I'm playing, and she stayed in that improvisation section, which seemed like 45 minutes. It was probably less than a minute, but then I got done, and they clapped, came in, and I played with them for the next two hours. It was just a blast, and they didn't, afterwards, they were showing, I was showing them something, and they, they didn't speak, and they said, otra vez, played again, and they went, oh, and we play it back. But anyway, this is a piece. It's uh, 12 beats in measure, but very specific. You have accents of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Hit 9 and you're told to leave. You know, you want to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And they're very specific. That's in, in it, uh, the dance itself. So you'll hear that in this. Thank you. <laughs> I'm being a teacher. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. What was that white wood on the face of that one? On this one that I was just playing, uh, that was uh, spruce. Spruce top. The whiter the wood, the brighter the sound. And with rosewood, uh, Indian rosewood or any of the rosewoods, the darker the wood, the richer the tone. And also with rosewoods, you get power. A punchy mid-range, um, a, uh, and uh, piercing trebles. In the 1950s, the whole folk music, those of us that remember that, Kingston Trio and everything, mahogany. It's very nice for accompanying, but you can drive it and get whatever sound that you want. Then uh, uh, a lot of country guitars uh, made entirely of um, um, maple, which is a very bright. And when you have, the, if you had a whole instrument out of rosewood, it'd be very dark and muddy. So you have to have both the white and the dark together. So that's where uh, actually Paul McCartney got the idea for ebony and ivory from both, not just the piano, but the guitars. <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much for coming on such a beautiful, I guess it is nice out, but cold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's your favorite out of all of them? <laughs> it's kind of like asking, which is your, f no. Uh, <laughs> and they're not old enough to go, mom, um, today uh, I, the new one that I had made and one that I have home, but, but this little one is just a blast to play. And however, the one I just ended with, that's the punchiest and it, it, I, I think a sound and it's there. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, just out of curiosity, 
How many in here learned how to play on a harmony or a K guitar? Yeah, that's uh, plywood never sounded so good, and that's what <laughs> I still have mine. And uh, the uh, you know the little Martin, and I know people here have beautiful Martin D35 out of Brazilian rosewood that people would kill for. <laughs> so anyway, yes. Jordan. Is there any guitar that you don't have that you wish you had? Or that you <laughs> the algebra, algebraic equation is X, the ideal number is X plus one, you know, and it's never achieved. But yeah, I have pretty much, I have a wonderful collection. And ever since high school, when friends have been paying off muscle cars and motorcycles for 50 years, I've been paying off guitars. Uh, <laughs> So, and mine are worth more now, too. I had a wonderful story. I had uh, one of them that uh, in, oh boy, when I was teaching in the late 70s, I played it in some, and one of the kids asked, how much did it cost? I said, well, this was 1800 Well, 1800 in 1976 was a lot, quite a chunk of money. I said, you pay that much for the, and I said, how many in here have a, uh, a, a new car? Have your parents, and I said, yeah, and how much was that? 25000 I said, what's it going to be worth in 10 years? Nothing, <laughs> you know, so it's all, it's all relative, but uh, the same kind of thing. And Farmington used to be a farm town when I was first started. And now it's it's changed with so many corporate buyouts of the farms that are have been consolidated. But uh, that's okay. <laughs> For Christmas, you want a ukulele, okay? Yeah. Um, and uh, I'd ask the same thing. And who bought a? Uh, how many in here? Uh, it was still farm and said, anybody in here, parents buy a tractor? And one girl raised her hand and said, how much was it? She said, it was 82,000 that was used. So I said, this is my tractor. And that made sense. Then the kind of, and then I take one of our school ones that looked pretty, I mean, shiny, you could comb your hair in it and uh, played it and then played the same thing on one of these. And it's like I said a minute ago, you think the sound and it's there. So, uh, Anyway, well, thank you for coming, and, oh, thank you, yeah. I've got, thank you. And I gotta see, I know I've got three, four, how many former students? Oh my, I saw, I didn't see. Cool, <laughs> wow, thank you. You look the same as you did in eighth, no, you don't. <laughs>